3, and then we'll look at Hebrews chapter 12 for a couple of verses. Luke chapter 23, the great crucifixion chapter. Oh, I tell you, when you think about what he was singing tonight, when you think about the Savior's death, you think about the cross, my, what a blessing. The Bible says the preaching of the cross is to those that perish foolishness, but to us who are saved, it's the power of God. Isn't that wonderful? And I love that, and I appreciate that, Brother Mark. Look with me, please, verse 33, chapter t- uh, 23. And I want you to stand with me, please, all of the house, for the reverencing of the reading of the Word of God. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also uh, with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him demigod and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and of Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Do you have your Bible now? Will you turn with me over to the book of Hebrews? And we're going to look at a couple of verses of Scripture. Here we... We see in chapter 11 of Hebrews the great race of the faithful ones. We see the faithful ones on God's honor roll, and he catalogs them, those that are on God's honor roll. And then he begins the 12th chapter talking about that race. He said, look at verse 1, chapter 12, the book of Hebrews. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Would you be seated all over the house and would you bow your head for just a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you tonight that back yonder 1900 years ago, thank God there was a day heaven had to hide its face. There was a day when our Savior bled and died, was crucified. They mocked, they scoffed, And yet while he was upon that cross, he looked down. And while he was suffering and while he was dying, I'm glad he saw and thought about this church. And he saw you and he saw me. And and Father, what a blessing it is to come tonight and bring a message on. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. I pray, our Father, you'll speak to every heart. And speak to every soul. Lord, there's some lost people here. There's some people here tonight that have never been to Calvary. They've never accepted the Lord Jesus. They've never come to that place of repentance and faith in Him who can forgive, who can justify freely. So I pray tonight you'll save that man, that woman, that boy and girl, that's standing nearest to eternity. And then I pray for the saints of God. Dear Lord, I thank you for this church and this most gracious pastor. Lord, I I want to thank you uh, tonight for Brother Ron, uh, for the fellowship we've had, even in the meeting. But Lord, many years ago as a young boy, I'm glad I met him on the way to heaven. 
And I pray that you'll bless this great church and the people here and that every preacher that's with us tonight and every layman and every one that's come have your precious sweet way. And we'll thank you because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Beloved, I want you to look this way and for a few minutes tonight. I want to speak on something that touches me. Something that moves me. Something, my friend, that causes me to bow humbly before the Lord and thank Him. I tell you, I never think about the cross. But what I think of my little mother who used to sing, If the cross be my glory ever. I think of that old song when I survey the wondrous cross. Oh, I tell you, it's a blessing. But because of time tonight, I want to take two words out of the song that he sang and give an introduction. First of all, he said he knew me. Oh, listen, while he was on that cross, Mr. He knew you, and he knew me. Now, the miracle in that song was, but he loved us. I don't see how God could love Man, but he did love us. We were unlovely. We we ought to be in hell. But I want you to know, my friend, he loved us. And while he was on that cross, thank God he knew us. But by way of introduction, let me give you three things when we look at the cross tonight. First of all, we see the depravity of man. We see the blackness of sin. You don't have to go down here to the beer joint and the hellhole of this world to see how black sin is. If you go outside Jerusalem on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross. And on that cross, he was dying for sinners. And you'll see the blackness of the depravity of the human heart and the blackness of sin. Not only when we look at that cross, we see the depravity of man, but secondly, we see the depth of the love of God. It'll go beyond the lowest hell. Oh, it'll reach way down. I want to tell you where sin did abound. Grace did much more abound. Oh, I see him reach down and get old drunks. I've seen him reach down and get old street walkers. And I want to tell you what a blessing. What a blessing it is to look at Calvary and see the depravity of man and see the depth of the love of God. And then number three, see a door opening in heaven. I'm glad, praise the Lord, of you. And a living way was opened that day. A door swung wide. An invitation was come on in. I'm glad, come ye sinners. Poor and needy, Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner whole. And on that cross, we see him dying. Now, I have about 27 messages on the cross, but I think this one tonight, and the one I spoke, I believe, a couple of years ago across town on the five touches of Calvary. While Jesus was on that cross, he touched five things. But tonight, I want to speak to you on while he was on the cross, you were on his mind. Now, can you comprehend that? Here with sin on him. Here he was, suffering and bleeding and dying. Oh, Isaiah said he looked like a root out of a dry ground. He was suffering as no other man was suffering. But oh, the miracle. I'm glad while he was on that cross, I was on his mind. But if you've got your pencil tonight, I want you to jot down five things that I believe Jesus had on his mind. While he was on the cross, I believe he had five things on his mind. They start with the letter C. Number one, I believe he had the church on his mind. Because the Bible said he loved the church. And he gave himself for the church. That's why I love the church. I believe God does business. 
spiritually to the local church. And I love the church. Oh, what a blessing it is to be part of the great church of the living God. What a blessing it is to love the house of God and the church of God. My Bible tells me that he loved the church and he gave himself for the church and for the joy that was set before him that day. He had the church on his mind. I believe he saw three things in the church. I believe he saw it a building. I believe he saw it a body. I believe he saw it a bride. You'll find these three types in the book of Ephesians. And you say, preacher, what? He saw a building. Not a building of brick and mortar. But he saw a spiritual house. And he set upon this rock. I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I want to tell you, it's built of lively stones, uh, living stones. I'm glad one day the last stone will be put in place. And hallelujah, as you were singing, we're going to rise. Praise God triumphantly. I'm glad that spiritual house will rise. Praise the Lord. Number two. Not only is he called a building, but he's called a body. Oh, that thrills me. A body tonight. You know what the Scripture says? He's the head of the church of the body. We're bone of his bone. We're flesh of his flesh. I'm glad tonight. Oh, I'm in the body. <laughs> Aren't you glad tonight that you are in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ? I can't explain this. A body here, but our heads in heaven. But we'll be really united one day. Hallelujah. That's a, my, listen, my head's not in Nashville, brother. My head of the church is not in Rome, Italy. I, I'm glad he's ever seated at the right hand. Come, we'll make intercession for you and me. And so it's a body. But I like this better, Nene. It's a bride. Oh, there's something about a wedding. There's something about a bride. You know, I, I tell you, my my wife, I, I met her in a bank. And I used to hang around the bank so much I thought I was vice president. Say amen right there. Yes, sir. I used to hang around the CNS Bank in Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, they thought, boy, he said, he's sure the head of the bank. I just, I wouldn't get away. And she was 18 years old. She didn't have a watch. She didn't have a wrinkle. She did not have any blemish. Now, don't tell her if you see her, but she's 62 now. She still doesn't have a blemish. She still doesn't have a wrinkle. And I'll tell you, I remember that night in the church I was pastoring. Now, now I, I wasn't qualified to be a pastor. Bible said, let the husband of brother be, let him be the husband of one wife. And I didn't have any wife. Uh, amen. But I'll tell you, I was married there in our church, and boy, you talk about a time. It's such a crowd there. You've never seen this standing around the walls. And I got down there, and just, my pastor said, who gives this woman away? And my father-in-law reluctantly said, I do. I reached over and took her hand. I said, wait a minute. I got to do a little preaching. I might not get this big a crowd in the church anymore. And I, and I had to do a little preaching. I, why you say preacher means that was foolish? No, you hear me. I, I want to tell you I've got a story to tell about a bride and the bridegroom. It's the Lord Jesus. And what a day that's going to be. Boy, when we gather over yonder, the bride with the bridegroom. There's going to be a meeting in there. There's going to be a wedding. A marriage of the Lamb. And what a blessing that's going to be. Now, quickly, let me give you something. And then we'll go somewhere else. Listen to me. There are two famous brides in the Bible that came from bleeding sides. The first came from the bleeding side of the first Adam. And the Bible said a deep sleep fell upon Adam. And out of his side, God took a rib and made a bride for him. Created out of a rib a bride and presented her to Adam. But I've got something better than that, mister. Nineteen hundred years ago, 
out of the bleeding side of the Son of God. There was a bride. Woo! Bless God. That makes me want to stop and shout about 30 minutes. Out of the bleeding side of the Son of God came the bride, the church. Oh, that thrills me tonight. That excites me tonight. The church is called the bride. And I'm glad I was preaching over here at Temple with Brother T.D. In fact, I've been with T.D. in every church he's ever been in. Every church he's ever pastored, I've been with Brother T.D. And I was over here at Temple about this church, and Brother Roy Lucas was leading the singing. He said to me one night, he said, I've got 114 in the choir. And he said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Now, we've got some ladies from Temple here, and they remember that night. Uh, he said, we're going to sing before Brother Mates comes. Here comes the bride. Well, I didn't know a missionary, a little missionary lady, had slipped down on the other side of the piano playing, or the piano over there, and she had a trumpet. Boy, she was blowing that trumpet and getting ready for something. And that choir stood, 114 of them, and old Roy started leading that. Here comes the bride. But when he got down to the chorus and said, Pick up your trumpet, Gabriel. That little lady started blowing that trumpet. You know what I started to do? I started to run out on Rossville Boulevard, find the highest telephone pole, raise my handkerchief and say, Come on, now. For the bride had made herself ready. Thank God. I will tell you tonight, when Jesus was on the cross, the church was on his mind. Number two, when Jesus was on the cross, the cup, C-U-P, was on his mind. It was a bitter cup, and let me stop long enough to say this. You're going to have some bitter cups to drink. I've had people come up to me and say, Brother Mays, have you ever had to drink the dregs of a bitter cup of disappointment and despondency? I said, yes. Oh, but listen to me. No one ever had to drink the cup the Savior drank. Now, watch this. I read you from Luke 23. Luke 22 says that he came to a garden called Gethsemane. That he went a little farther and he prayed, Father, let this cup pass over me, but not my will, but thy will be done. You say, preacher, why did he want to drink that cup? There were three things in that cup. Write them down. The reason Jesus did not want to drink it. Number one, it was sin. And the Bible said, he that knew no sin were made it worse sin. Sin was in that cup. Jesus is the only one that never took a wrong step, never thought a wrong thought. Thank God he's the sinless Son of God. You can find fault with preachers and you can find fault with churches. But I know one tonight that's sinless. Whoa, that blesses me. Thank God I find no fault in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible says in Isaiah, and I, I'm going to ask Isaiah when I get to heaven what he meant. Well, I can see what the Bible would say if the sin of Chattanooga was poured out on him. I can see he have said the sin of Tennessee. But he said, the iniquity of us all was laid upon him. He didn't want that cup. He didn't want that sin. Number two, write this down. Oh, it was their sin in the, there was shame. They stripped him and hanged him in shame. The Bible said he despised Oh, the perfect Son of God. The Bible said despising the shame. But here's the worst part of it all. Not only did the cup contain sin and shame, but it contains separation. You see, that's the hardest thing the Father ever did. Oh, you read this Bible. The Father had a lot of chores he had to do. And I'm sure it hurt the Father. But when Jesus was hanging on that tree at about 1.30 in the afternoon... It was dark as midnight. Jesus looked up and said, He said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, You've left your throne. We've never been separated. Oh, we've been together for eons of eternity. Past. We've never been separated. But I want to tell you, God turned His back on His throne. 
Oh, Jesus didn't want that. No wonder Jesus prayed, let this cup pass over me. Separation of them cup. Number three, not only did Jesus have his mind on the church and on the cup, but he had his mind on the crowd that were crucifying him. He didn't have his mind on the high priest. He didn't have his mind on a, a righteous man. You know what he had his mind on while he was on that cross? He said that crowd that failed the name. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I want to tell you when the church gets to the place that you don't love that crowd that's unlovely. That you don't love poor old sinners that come about. You say, Preacher Mays, our King loves sinners. Well, Jesus did. He loves sinners. Best thing they ever said about him, they said it in sarcasm. They said he eateth and drinketh with sinners. And he was in the house of a Pharisee. You know the story? But I'm glad they packed this on. Said he's a friend of sinners. If he hadn't been a friend of sinners, I wouldn't be here tonight. Oh, hallelujah. You're here and you're lost tonight. They may not understand you. And they do not understand you. And if you're lost tonight, you may feel lonely and you are alone. And you may feel hopeless and you are hopeless. But I want to tell you, I know a friend that loves you. Hallelujah. I'm glad he said he's a friend of sinners. You say, preacher me. Hear me tonight. He prayed for the murderers. He prayed for the crucifiers. He didn't have a root of bitterness and said, I'm not going to forgive that crowd. They nailed me to the tree. That's the first crowd he prayed for. Oh, he prayed for that old wicked crowd, that blasphemous crowd, that crowd that mocked him and said, If thou be the Son of God, come down. But he didn't come down. I'm glad he didn't. Oh, you say, Preacher Mays, the crowd. I mean, I used to pastor a first Baptist church, and I don't tell all this stuff. But I had some in my church, and they gave me. They gave me. They did. I can tell that crowd in my church didn't like that. And I had some lawyers and doctors. <laughs> Lord and mercy. Some rich folks. <laughs> I'll guarantee you that's the tightest bunch you'll ever uh, get around is that rich crowd. Say amen. Bless God, it's these good old hard-working folks that get that little check every Friday. That'll tithe and keep the church going. Tell me! It's that crowd. It's not that other crowd. But I had some in my church and they thought they knew something. <laughs> oh, they thought, boy, we're God's gift to this church. And they were poor in God's sight. They were naked in God's sight. And I had a few little saints that didn't have much money. But they were really spiritually the one the Lord. Oh, I want to tell you something, brother, that thrills me. And I remember one Sunday we had the first bus I ever heard about. First bus I ever heard about. Forty-four years ago, we had the first bus. We sent out and got some little ragged youngins and poor folks and, and some grown folks that were ragged. And brought them in our little chairs with our little steeple, with our fancy pews. And you know what? One of the deacons said, they'll have to go. I said, no. If they go, I'm going they go, Jesus will go because that's why He came. He came because He loved that crowd. He loved sinners. And I'm glad, praise the Lord. The crucifiers that day, He didn't say like some of you, well, I won't forgive Miss so and so. She thinks the choir now. You'll never get blessed as long as you don't forget. Somebody, I, I never will forget my oldest boy. <laughs> he tickled me either. But he'll never let you know this. He'll never let you know it. But uh, he's got a Ph.D. from Southern California. That's a pretty good degree, Ph.D. Of course, it's a postal digger if you want to know what I think about it. I mean, but I remember how studious he was when he was a little boy. 
And I remember one day he came to me, and, and I wasn't right. I was wrong. See, I'm not like some of you who make it out like everything's right all the time. Bless God, I'm wrong a lot of times. He came in, he said, I'm about seventh grade. He said, Dad, I'd like to go to school tonight. I said, you can't go up like that sinful school at night. Well, he said, Dad, we'll just have uh, my class. And that's all. I said, you can't go. We sat down to eat that night's supper. Well, gee, some of you folks don't know when supper comes. You call it dinner. Bless God, I call it supper. We sat down to supper, and I said, Lord, would you pray, please? He said, dear Lord, I want to thank you for saving me, for giving me my sins. I want to thank you for two good brothers and a good mother. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> and I thought, have mercy. Here I am sitting here at the table. And so I said, well, I'm going to pray for you when we help them with the Now, that's the devil getting in. You know, you can say what you want. You can say, oh, that's just the Irish. It's the devil. That's what it is. But I went to bed that night, and I figured I couldn't sleep. My wife finally said, no. I said, yes. She said, you need to tell them. I said, no, if you go to sleep, everybody will get along good in this house. Praise God. <laughs> Boy, that conscience is killing me. And I said, Lord, <laughs> I said, he's a nervous child, very studious. And, and I said, if you'll just let him, uh, just let him go to sleep and let me go to sleep. I said, in the morning at breakfast, I'll apologize. <laughs> Seemed like the Lord said, no, I'll just keep you awake if you don't get up and go apologize. And don't ask for it. I said, God, I'm a preacher. He said, that's where you got to go. You're a preacher. <laughs> they have to go first. See, some of you deacons go second, but they go first. That gift you. So I may well forget it. About 2.30, I put my feet off the bed, and I said, well, praise God. And I said, praise God. I said, I've got to go across the hall, open his door, and if he's shocked, and, and I said, when I open that door, there, if I wake him up, and I, I said, I, I may be sorry if I scare him. You pray. And I got up and got ready, and I opened my door to go across the hall where he was. And he was standing right there in the hall, big old tears coming down his cheeks. And he said, Daddy, I've been standing here an hour and a half, wanting to come in there and tell you I'm sorry. And I said, Shh, let me confess a little while. I grabbed him around the neck, and you never heard such confession in your life. I, oh, I said, Lord, it's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, Lord. I did wrong. I had the wrong spirit. I didn't have the right spirit. I, I was wrong. My wife raised up and said, Hey, what are you doing? I said, We're having a camp meeting, go to sleep, praise God. It's getting better all the time. But oh, we've got to get that unforgiving spirit. Listen to me. When he was on the cross, you know who he forgave? The crowd that nailed him back. The crowd that pierced him. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. First, the church was on his mind. Secondly, the cup was on his mind. Thirdly, the crowd was on his mind. When he was on that cross, that blood coming down. Number four, the completion of redemption was on his mind. That's where he came. Oh, he didn't come to be king here now. He'll be king the next time. But he came to seek and to save that which is lost. And he came to finish redemption's plan. Now listen to me. He couldn't have died before they gave him to the tree. It would all be in hell. He hadn't have made it till 3 o'clock. He couldn't die at 2.30. He had to die at 3 o'clock. And I want to show you something. Inside that day was a holy of holies. And that Holy of Holies had a veil there. Now let me tell you how long that veil had been in the temple. I mean, uh, uh, had been in those tabernacles that moved around. That veil had been there 1,500 years. And that veil stood before the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was a cube. No natural light could get back there. The Shekinah glory had to light it. There were the ark, the cherubim. There... In the Holy of Holies, once a year, a priest went in, Leviticus, and once a year, that priest offered blood for the nation of Israel. 
But I got good news for you. When my Savior went in, thank God He offered salvation to the whole world. Oh, what a blessing it is. Let me show you something real quick. quick. Now watch this. That priest, I have a sermon on the garments of the priest. And, and boy, he had all this embroidery stuff all around it. It was beautiful. But what I want to show you, down at the hem of his garment, down at the hem, he had it decorated with two things. He had a plum granite and a bell. And a plum granite and a bell. And a plum granite and a bell all the way around the bottom of that garment. You know why? Because when he went into the Holy of Holies, he had two things in his hands. He had incense and the blood. And that incense, when he walked into that holy place, he staggered like a drunk man. They thought outside he'd die. They thought outside he would die in the presence of a holy God. You know what he did? He got in and that incense blotted him out. You see, a sinful man, I don't care if he is a priest, cannot stand before a holy God. The incense was to blot him out. That was this on Joseph. And as he staggered, and that incense scattered all, is it scattered all over the holy, in that holy place? Listen to me. Second thing happened. The veil started ringing. He, he staggered the veil and ring. Outside, you know what they'd say? He's a living. <laughs> I hear the bells are ringing. He's living! Did you know while I go for out at the motel? I started talking to him. I heard the bells ringing, and I said he's living to make intercession. For the church of the living God, Mister, I've heard the bells ringing. He's living. Hallelujah. What a blessing that is. He's living. Oh, that's sweet to me. The Savior lives. The Savior lives. The Savior lives. Now, what's this? The high priest came out, and for another year, I had to wait for him to go back in the Holy of Holies. But it's Calvary now. No more turtle doves and pigeons. And, sh- and uh, no more, state goes, listen to me. The eternal sacrifice forever is being offered on a hill called Calvary. Amen. Now what's this? The afternoon sacrifice was about to be made. A priest went up and put blood on the veil. Seven drops to be exact. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He put seven drops of blood to stand on before that veil. He leaned his head over against that blood because he knew that the Bible taught when I see the blood. How so many of you. Where may nine prove the blood? Boy, he knew that. That day is a little different. He reached over and laid his head against that blood on the on the veil. And he was standing on seven drops of blood, but on a hill far away. A savior lifted his voice and listened to what he said. It's finished! It's finished. And the veil was rent in twain from top to bottom. Woo! Don't you know it scared that guy to death from that thing split right down the middle? And it fell over here. Listen, a new sign was placed up. Come on in. You've been having to stay out, but thank God the new and living way has been made this day. Come on in. The blood sprinkle away. When Jesus said he's finished, he didn't mean for the abs baptism to salvation. You're baptized in obedience to the command of our Lord after you are saved. You don't take communion to add to your salvation. You take communion to show forth his death and resurrection and coming again. Nothing can be added. That day he finished. (laughs) Oh, that day on the cross. He had on his mind the finishing. Uh, Listen, he had on his mind the completion of redemption for mankind. Hallelujah. I don't write this last thing down. When he was on the cross, he had a coronation on his mind. 
Oh, thank God. <laughs> We're going to crown him one day. Oh, what a blessing that's going to be. A friend of mine lives across town. And his name's Paul O'Neill. Paul went to the Holy Land with us once. And every time that airplane would stop or that boat would stop, I'd say, Paul, sing that song you wrote. And this young man from Chattanooga, he's not young now, he's like myself, would sing, In a land far away, there'll be a great coronation day. But they can't crown Jesus till we all get there. Boy, I want to tell you that blessed my soul. A boy, in, a man in Chattanooga wrote it. They can't crown Jesus till we all get there. And what a blessing. They're going to have to wait till we all get there. <laughs> and then, well, let me give you something else. John 19 said they had a mock coronation. They put a crown of thorns on his head. Said, hey! They put a reed in his hand. They mocked him. Said, you're the king, are you? <laughs> a mock coronation. But it won't be like that the next time. Revelation 19 says, and we'll crown him with many crowns, praise God. And we'll sing, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. I'll tell you when he was on the cross for the joy that was set before him. You know what he saw? He saw that coronation day. He saw that day when we'd run and stand there around him in heaven. And crown him Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We're going to crown him. My middle son is my pastor. And he used to go with me to meet all the time and hear what he'd say. He'd say, Dad, will you tell that about the king? I said, No, I'm not going to tell it. I told it right this week when you told me. I'm not. And he said, Dad, I want you to tell it. And so, because it's about a coronation, I'll tell you tonight. Several years ago, in England, there was a king. He wanted to be loved by his people and his kingdom. He said, I want them to love me. I don't want them to love my crown and the scepter and the golden shoes. I want them to love me because I love them. And so once a month, he had a parade in the most beautiful chariot. And they'd go down the boulevard, the people run out and scream and say, Live forever, King! Live, we love you, King. Eat at our house. Spend the night here. And one day the King was coming back through the route of the big parade. He said, to the fellow, he said We're not going to make another parade for three months. And when he got back to the palace and the gates opened and he went in, he said, Hey, you search to me, I want to tell you something. Find me a tramp my size. I'll let my beard go out. I'll let my hair go out and jag it up. But I'm going to parade. After three months, I'm going down the boulevard, the parade route, and I'm going to see how many will love me. I'm going to see if they love the beautiful robe and the beautiful crown. I'll see if they love me. So three months passed. Boy, he dirtied himself up, dressed in an old ragged shirt and ragged trousers. Got him a stick with some old rags on it. He said to the man out at the gate, Hey, you think I look good as a tramp? He said, Boy, we'd never know you as a king. He said, Hey, don't you call Scotland Yard. I said, Don't call Scotland Yard. I don't know when I'll be back. But you remember, don't call Scotland Yard. And the king started down the boulevard, the parade route. They saw him. He didn't recognize him. They saw a tramp, and one lady was over in the little flower garden, and he walked over and said, Hi, ma'am. And she said, You get away from here, you dirty man. Get away, or I'll call the cop. And the king thought, Well, she doesn't love me. She always asked me to stop at her house when I was in the big jacket. So he went down to the man standing there in the yard, and he said, Hello, how are you? The man said, get away, I'll seek my dog on you. And on and on, all day, just about it. And the, he came to the place where they always stopped. There were three lights, light posts, three lights, and three tracks. 
And he said, well, I always turn around here. And he leaned up against the light post. His feet were throbbing. His hands were weary. He'd never walked that far. He felt like everybody hated him and everybody despised him. And he happened to look across the railroad track. And there was a little house. He said, I've tried everything else. Might as well try over there. So he went over and he knocked on the door. And when he did, a little girl holding her dad's breeches leg said, Hi, mister. And the king said, Would you say that again, little lady? And she looked up and said, Hi, mister. He said, That's the first nice thing that's been said to me. She said, Thank you. I needed that. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I needed that. And her daddy said, Listen, you know the law of harboring a king or a tramp? So they didn't know his king. And he said, We'll have to leave. He said, All we have is a little soup. Some for my wife, myself, and my little girl. We have one bed for me and my wife and a little cot for my little girl. You can't stay here, Mr. Frank. And the little girl started to cry and said, Hey, Papa, let him stay tonight. <laughs> I'll go to bed hungry and you can have my bowl of soup. And he started to weep and he said, No, I she said, Oh yeah, I, I like him. And uh, she said, Papa, he sleep my little bed in yonder. And I'll make a paddock and sleep on the floor. And that night he slept with angels' wings. And the next morning they got up and they gave him all they had, just a piece of bread and a little something like gravy mixed up in. He ate and he got ready to leave. And the little girl called him in. And she said, you're coming back. When you get hungry, you can still have my soup. And when you get tired, you can sleep in my bed. He said, I'll be back. I'll be back. And he said to the mother and dad, would you go in that other room to close the door? I'll not hurt your little girl. I promise you, I'll not touch her. So they went in that room and shut the door. And when they did, he got on his knees. And he said, come in. Oh, she said, I'm not afraid to come. And the boy said, I want you to hug my neck now. I want you to look at my eyes. And don't forget the eyes. You'll forget everything else. But don't forget my eyes. And the little girl started to cry. And the mother and dad ran out and said, Did he bother? She said, No. He's got some pretty stars that I've ever seen. <laughs> the king left as the tramp that went across the tracks and harder and harder and faster and faster until he got the open the gate. And they said, The king is coming. He went in and he said, get the barber, get the best robe, get the best crown I've got, get the best set, get the finest chariot in the commonwealth of England, get eight of the greatest horses, and in one hour and fifteen minutes I'll be ready. I'm going to get the family. I'm going to get the family. He dressed and bathed and came out. And he looked up and he said, Hey, sir, I want you to really blow that trumpet today. Blow it out! And I'm going to sit up there with you. Always sit. And so they went out down the parade route and he blow the trumpet, and that woman, she went out and said, Oh, King, I love you. Live forever. And he leaned over and said, That's not what you said yesterday. And they kept going. And all they said, he kept sounding that trumpet. And every time you'd sound that trumpet, somebody come out and say, King, stop at our little house. He said, I did yesterday. And you seek the dog on me. And they came to the three lamp posts, and they came to the tracks. And the serfs, that's the guys that would turn around. He said, we used to turn around. He said, see that little house that's yonder? Pull up there! I've got a family in that house. He said, I'm going to take these three crowns with me. He said, but, but, but Mr. King, he said, I, I've got a family for you now. They're going to wear crowns just like I wear crowns. 
And he got down off of that. He said, I look good. And they said, boy. He said, you never look better, King. I tell you, that's the British crown of it. That, that garment, it's beautiful. Hey, King, you look wonderful. He said, you stay here and I'll be right back. He went up to that door and took the scepter and said, and the door slowly opened. And the little girl holding his breeches leg said, he was just a tramp on the street, mister. And he said, no, don't bother my daddy, Mr. King. I liked him and I still like him. If he ever comes back, he can have my suit. If he ever comes back, he can have my bed. And the king said, is that so? She said, and he said, that's so. The little girl said, Mr. King, if you're going to put him by jail, put me in jail. And when, when uh, he looked down at the little girl, he said, Mother, will you and Dad go in that room for just a moment? I'll not hurt to them. They went in there and closed the door. The little girl stood back, twisted her little fingers, and she said, I don't care what you say, Mr. King. You ain't changing my mind. He was hungry, and I gave him something. <laughs> he was touched, and I gave him to drink. He was tired, and I gave him a bed, and I'm not sorry either, Mr. King. And the king smiled and said, come on, come on close. She said, I, I'm not going to hug you. Oh, he said, I don't want you to hug my man. He reached up and pushed his crown back. He said, uh, come up close. She got up close, and he turned around and said, look at those eyes. And when she looked at those eyes, she started screaming and clapping her hands. Mother and dad ran out. And when they ran out, they said, what's the king doing to you, honey? She said, nothing. Said yesterday he was a tramp, but today he's the king. Oh, mama said, I love him. Yesterday he was a tramp on the street, but today he's the king of England.